Hello, my name is Rich Howard, owner of Architectural Builder Supply, and this video is to bring you a closer look at the Corbin Russwin part number H4 7 pin 11 uh, nickel silver key blank. Uh, this sold in a box of 50. That's how you, you know, special order, special order key blanks or key blanks that are just not stock. They can be ordered if they're not, you know, restricted. But they're going to be sold in a box of 50 generally. That's pretty much what I find um, by most manufacturers. Sometimes a bag of 10, things of that nature. But this is an unusual key blank in the sense that I've never run into an H4 keyway before. But this is a Russwin. H series, an H4 keyway. Be able to see the shape of the profile here. That's called a paracentric keyway. It's a locksmithing term to simply mean that the vertical center line of the cylinder plug is crossed by the key blank. Paracentric, paracentric key ways are important because they work to eliminate the possibility of making a key that will potentially operate the cylinder. If you were to take a piece of metal and just file it so thin that it would pass through, it wouldn't work with a paracentric keyway because you cross that center line. You'd file it down to nothing and still not be able to get through it at that. Well, you'd have nothing to get through. But I think the point is taken. This is an H4. An H4 is part of a multiplex system, which we'll get into. It's a seven pin cylinder, seven pin length. The maximum length on a, on a uh, Corbin Russwin system that I'm aware of. Um, it is a dash one, meaning it's a standard bow shape. That is the current Corbin Russwin head. The, the old bow of the key was a Russwin shape. A little bit more like this. Uh, the, 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 the one means standard. You can also, the, the one in the 11, the first one means standard bow. You can do these in a, in a large bow, in a jumbo bow, and then you can do high security bows as well. That wouldn't apply to this, uh, this key blank because it's not high security. The one in the part number means it's plain. That's handy in the sense that the most common thing that's used to identify a key blank is what does the bow look like? Just that shape. So Walter Schlage, back in the early part of the 20th century, obtained a design patent on the head of his key blank. Well, you better believe so did Corbin Russwin when they, they put a design patent on that. That protects this shape to them only, okay? Um, or protected, I should say. I doubt it's under current protection. Uh, I'll be quite convinced it's not. Uh, this was ordered plain, so it doesn't say Corbin Russwin on either side. That's the other part. What does it look like? What name is on it? You know, that, that helps people identify what they're working on. Certainly locksmiths. That's the first thing we look at. What, is the, what does that bow look like? We're not, I don't think anyone is looking at the profile unless you're, you know, some, unless you are a locksmith who, uh, well, locksmiths do naturally, but unless you are someone who works in a key duplication, key identification, the deployment of keys alone all the time, versus a locksmith who will work on two or three systems or a half a dozen different key systems, but focus on installing locks and access control and alarms and things of that nature. I don't think some people are looking at the profile or the keyway of that of this key blank. I know that I would never identify it. You can also do it in a do not duplicate. The the standard is the zero. It's going to say Corbin Russwin on it, or plain, which is one. Two is a do not duplicate, and then three is a U.S. property do not duplicate. And you would see that, I think, in locks, cylinders that operate postal service boxes, which is a crime actually to duplicate those keys, then in the absence of anything past all of that, you're going to get a nickel silver key. You could also order B for brass. While I didn't specify it on this order, they've clearly given us 
brass key blanks, okay, which is the most common key blank to do this in. Brass is a very durable material used for locksmithing, has a hardness similar to the other hardness that it will encounter on the pins inside the cylinder, which will also be made of brass. You don't want to have disparate materials. One is simply going to wear the other one out. There is a link below this video to the technical data um, that will allow you to review everything that I just covered. Okay. The second page of that shows how the older series of Corbin and Ruswin bows of their key blanks morphed into the 10 series. Okay. We talked about the other series that can be done, the 5, 7, and 9, which would be a 5, 0, a 7, 0, and then a 9, 0. Um, I, I don't think I've ever seen a 50 series bow. Um, might make it a little bit easier to work. Uh, a large bow. Um, I've never seen that either. High security material I've seen, and it does have that unique shape, that's to be sure. Further down into the catalog, there is a what would really operate as a depth and spacing chart, which should be, I think, near the end of the... It is at the end, actually, of the document. So this shows the Corbin Russwin Z and DH class. They're System 70, uh, system of... of key theory, key material. This is going to apply to those keyways that are there. And in particular, in, an, in our case, the H1 through H8 keyway. Before we uh, get to that, the rest of that page, the last page that's in the document, I believe the third page is going to show us the multiplex system as I scroll to get to it. The multiplex system of our H keyways, and, and indeed it does. Um, so this is an H4. You can see at the bottom of that tree, there are eight keyways. Uh, this is a multiplex system. What that means is you can have eight different keyways. None of those keyways work each other. You can't take an H4 and stick it into an H3. It just won't go in, and vice versa, nor for any of those keyways. However, you'll notice on top of the H3 and the H4 sits the H34. That's a multi-section key blank. That's a blank that you can order. That blank will pass into your H3 and H4 um, cylinder plugs. You look on top of that, you've got an H41. That multi-section blank will work everything through H1 through H4, all four of those keyways. And if you look above there, you have an H81, and that will pass all eight of them. You, you may ne not need to know any of that at all. You just, you just don't have a reason to talk about multiplex. But if you're looking at this video, it's possible. If you're looking at a 7-pin H4 key blank, it's possible that you do want to know about the multiplex system if you don't already know it better than me. A multiplex system is used for, I think its primary purpose is when you have an exceptionally large system of locks. I don't mean a hundred, I mean tens of thousands. where you have a 5 or a 6 or a 7 pin, the number of theoretical possible key combinations on a 5 pin or a 6 pin or a 7 pin is a finite number. It, there's a theoretical number based on the depth and spacing chart that you can get so many thousands or tens of thousands of possible key changes depending on the 5, 6 or 7 pin length of the cylinder, okay, and then how many steps you can work inside you'll come up with a theoretical number. You'll discard the numbers that are no good because they violate rules, or it's just bad locksmithing to use a key that's 555555. You wouldn't use that. You'll get down to an actual number. 
if you have a Big Ten University and you don't have a hundred doors or a thousand doors installed, you have tens of thousands of doors. You will run out of key changes. You could, here, here's how you use the multiplex system. You would make your bidding list of all your, all your possible key changes, several thousands or, or a few thousand. I would expect that you're doing a six or a seven pin system. And you might say, well, that's great. I've got another 30,000 doors I have to take care of. <laughs> okay. I would hope you had a six or a seven pin system. You could take that bidding list and use the same bidding list over and over again, eight times in this case, and just assign an H1, an H2, an H3, and so on. You have no concern over the fact that the biddings are identical because the key blanks won't even pass into each other. It's not even a problem. So dorm building one is going to be on an H1 keyway. Dorm building two is on an H2 keyway. And that's it. You got two big dorm buildings. Well, ma uh, emergency services can walk around with an H12 and go everywhere. You see how that works. You can also really tone that down and say, well, I'm not, I don't work on a Big Ten University. However, the way I use it personally is a simple application. Got a home in Chicago, it's a bungalow. Bungalow's got a front door, it's got a side door, it's got a back door and a basement door. That's just how they are. All of them are like that. Um, you used to be able to buy bungalow homes from Sears as a kit. Um, literally, buy all the construction materials to build yourself a house. I use, I don't use this exactly. This is an example of what I use. I would put my H1 on my four doors. Okay. A uh, total of eight locks. Front door, side door, basement door, back door. And the back door would be a porch that would go down. Basement door would be below grade. Um, partially below grade. On my garage door, because I want the landscaper to come and get inside the garage to get the lawnmower, I'm going to give him an H2. I'm going to walk around with an H12. The advantage of that is not only do I not care that they have a key in the sense of they have a key, oh my gosh, but their key won't work my house because it won't even enter the cylinder. And that would be an easy way for you to be able to deploy in your own small kingdom a multiplex system that makes sense. A typical example is, you know, a three-story uh, apartment, um, a, uh, a three-story office building, insurance company here, uh, l law firm here, architectural firm here, H1, H2, H3. The boss man walks around with the H41, the owner of the building. It's that simple. Okay. You can expand on that. Now, to the depth and spacing chart on the last page, that information goes real, really far into the woods on keying as it pertains to Corbin Russwin. There is a link below this video to the manufacturer's page where you can pull up uh, the keying and service manual from Corbin Russwin. It is the all governing document as to the publicly released information as it pertains to Corbin and Russwin and Corbin Russwin over the decades. If you deal with Corbin Russwin at all, you have to have that document. If you are curious about locksmithing, that would be a capstone document to review. Um, at least bookmark it. That graph that's there serves as a depth and spacing chart, meaning it tells me my shoulder stop dimension right here to my first cut, which is 0.25 inch. It then tells me my center to center of all my successive cuts. The only other thing you have to know at that point is what's my root depth? What's the depth of my cut? And they will then show you what your cut depth needs, your root depth needs to be. Okay for your different pins. This is, and let's talk about those cuts. It might look backwards to you, it's not. 
it's a root depth. A root depth is measured from the bottom of the key blank to the bottom of the cut, not the depth of the cut itself. So you take the effective plug diameter, which may not be on this page. I would think that it would be. Oh, okay, yeah, 0 0.509. Let's just say it's 0 0.509. Um, or it might, it might be 0 0.5. I forget what it is. The point of the matter is you take your plug, your, your effective plug diameter, you subtract your root cut, and then you have your pin length. That's why a 6 is a smaller dimension than your 1, because we're not measuring the depth of the cut. It's what's left over after you make the cut. Okay. Now you know your stop to first cut, your center to centers. You know what your root depths need to be. Based on that information, you have all the technical knowledge to cut yourself a key, as long as you got a caliper. You can measure the root depth. The other thing that you must know is that you have a 90 degree cutting angle and that your plateau at the bottom is 0 0.053. That means the cutter that you use must be compliant with that. Whatever machine you're using must be compliant with that. And you'll see even on that page, they say use a CX6A code card for the HPC 1200 Blitz. That card will tell you what cutter to use and that will give you the proper profile of cut. Now you don't need to know the depth and spacing if you're going to cut it with a 6X, uh, CX6A card. None of that matters. But depth and spacing charts really allow you to cut a key without that knowledge. Not that you ever would, but locksmiths do is the bottom line. Other important data that's on there, I think, worthy of mentioning in relationship to this key. Uh, they've got some part numbers that are there for different pieces and parts and etc. Uh, so that's all nice to know. The important part about this document is drawing it, the attention to the document itself because the corbin russwin system may be the most diverse. And I don't know that to be true because of my ignorance when it comes to the overall universe of locksmithing. If I was going to bet, I'd say Sargent's pretty complicated in terms of depth and breadth. I would say Yale is probably in there as well, but you've got Corbin and Russwin and then merging and existing over decades and decades. And in fact, over a hundred years, I'm sure. Uh, I'm not, I'm sure I know. Um, and trying to keep all of that working because in the world of Corbin and Russwin and Corbin Russwin, people are going to encounter locks that are from World War I. It's going to happen. You'll be in New York City and you're going to see locks that are decades old that you don't have a relative old enough to be older than locks that you'll walk by. And that's why this data is so important to be there because if you're a practicing locksmith, you have to have that on file or you're just not going to be successful on that job. Uh, anyway, uh, seven pin plain bow H4 brass key blank by Corbin Russwin. If you have any questions on this or any other Corbin Russwin document, please feel free to reach out to us. And thank you.